Good morning, ladies. Thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate it. We have a really good crowd today, and I'm really glad about that. Um, Today we have uh, two of us ladies speaking. Rebecca Kaufman's going to be speaking for us first, and then I'll be speaking, and then Pastor. And um, our theme is dealing with difficulties, tribulations, troubles in your life. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Rebecca. It's I know it's really nerve-wracking being up here. I'm nervous even, you know, <laughs> making the announcement. So thank you very much for your smiling faces. And I know you're looking forward to it, and I am too. So let's begin. First, we'll sing a song, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and I will let Rebecca come on up. So we're going to sing Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Okay, Rebecca, come on up. Oh. I said I was going to have a word of prayer, but we'll, lush, we'll just let Rebecca come on up. <laughs> Sorry. I'm really nervous. <laughs> Do you think the mic, mic is, is that necessary? Um, yes. You can put it to your... Okay, I didn't have any thoughts, so... Should be able to clip it on. Okay, if for some reason you guys uh, like get feedback or something, you'll have to be like, you know, so. Um, but um, some of you know me. My name's Rebecca Kaufman, and um, I think it's a great honor to be able to come and talk to you ladies today. And um, I just pray that as God has used um, the things that he's done in my life, that he will use that to bless and um, really, but more than anything, to honor his name, to magnify him. And um, that's kind of my heart today. And um, so if we can go ahead and um, just pray and ask God to bless today um, and the message that he gave me. Dear God, I thank you, Lord, for... I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy, and I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for um, just every single lady in here and the souls they represent, the families they represent, the fact that they're willing to um, come and take their Saturday and um, want to spend time in your word. And, Lord, I just pray that um, you will do something mighty, that we'll walk out of here revived and um, ready to fight for you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I should, my mom, see, I asked my mom to come because um, she always has tissue in her purse. So if I start crying and I walk back there, you'll know I'm like, uh, that's my tissue lady. So, um, so anyway, I do appreciate my mom and my sister um, coming today. They are a great blessing in my life. And um, so hopefully this will also be an encouragement to them. So today I now I'm usually I walk and I don't have pockets so I'm stuck to a microphone and I'm usually like a traveling talker so if uh, is this can I can I carry this in my hand okay super cool um, so <laughs> I'm gonna do that because um, it helps me to think so um, today I want to talk to you I want to take you into um, a place that some of you, hopefully you all have had coffee and you um, are ready to go on a little bit of a journey. It's a little bit of a, um, kind of like a weird journey, but we're going to go into the desert and we're going to go into the place of the dragon. Um, in Psalm 44, if you have your Bibles, if you want to look in Psalm 44, uh, verse 18 and 19, and um, I'm going to 
I'm going to try to use a lot of scripture today and not because I don't have anything to say. I'm sure I could think of a lot of things to talk to you guys about. But um, because, you know, we were learning in Master's Club, every word of God is pure. And I'd much rather, you know, talk about God's word than what I have to say. So in Psalm 44, 18 and 19, it says... Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way, though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. And so today I want to talk about the place of a dragon. And, you know, like we think about dragons, we have all these mythological pictures in our minds. Um, I kind of have... I always think about them as dinosaurs, and I was at the gym the other day, and they had this thing about um, crocodiles on, and I was thinking about how cool it is that, you know, really, those are still, like, we have these creatures that are still these kind of dragonish sort of things, but one of the things about dragons is that they, um, they're seen in desolate places. They're like this desert, this kind of place where they're, they're kind of grown over with nettles and thorns, and when we think about dragons, we think of, like, untamable. We think about... Fierce. We think about um, that, that they're kind of like in dark places, and and so I kind of want to take you in this place, this 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 place of dragons that I've been and um, for for quite a while. So. Um, so when I was asked to talk to you about going through trials and difficult times, uh, I think I was the one that was coming up to give you an example of what not to do. So, so I hope hopefully you'll walk away and go, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take like what Rebecca did, and I'll say I'm not gonna go down that particular path. But um, I. I kind of wanted to get up and talk to you about like things that my family are going through. I, you know, I could I could talk about trials and struggles that my family have gone through or past churches I've been through. I, I could be like, oh, you know, these are the things. But what God kind of like helped me to recognize in all that I've gone through in the last couple of years is um, that the problem was in me, <laughs> and so that's why um, if I can if I can show you what what um, he's done, then um, I think that will be a blessing. So, um, so this place I, I came to, how, did, how do you get in the place, in this desert place? You know, a couple years ago, maybe it was actually like 10 years ago, um, eight or 10, I was, if you looked at my life, I was you know, homeschooling my kids. I was part of a lot of different ministries. I was, you know, I had teenage girls that I was kind of like working with. And um, so you could say, oh, well, you know, I was busy doing things. But obviously there was there was things falling through the cracks because I kind of, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but this pivotal moment happened in my life. Um, and I didn't recognize it for what it was at the time, but, and it's going to sound weird, but I was out soul winning and I had gotten to, um, we were out talking to people and I had run across this Muslim family and um, I was telling them my testimony. At first they were resistant. They were not interested in what I had to say, but as we continued to talk, they were really open. You know, they started saying, hey, you know, that... Like they they were receptive to the gospel and um, and they said we want you to come back we want you to come back and talk to us and I said you know okay sure and I planned on coming back the next week but something weird happened when I left and um, I was excited I was super thrilled about what God was going to do and then it's like this thought came into my mind and I said, I knew the struggles my family was going through. I knew where I was in my life. And I said, you know what? I'm going to fail these people. I, I'm going to like, I have nothing to give them. And who am I? Like, what am I doing out here telling people about Jesus and trying to like, you know, help them? Like, I'm going to fail them. And... So I didn't go back. I didn't go back. And I said, that's it. You know, and I can super spiritualize that. I can say, oh, well, of course, you know, we're all going to fail. But there's probably a part, like a lot of it is probably laziness. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe I realized it was going to take work and time to like spend time with these people. And maybe I didn't want to do that. 
So, you know, when we, um, in James, it talks about um, when it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him that ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I, I wavered. And I said, okay, God, you're not, you're not big enough to keep, keep me, you know, to, to do this. And I looked at myself. So my whole life, I didn't realize it at the time, but shifted manward. I stopped looking, like, to God for things. And so I didn't realize as the trials started, they, they were there already, but as thing, the waves started coming in, I didn't have the right perspective anymore to deal with those things. And so... Um, so I would spend all this time running and running and running and I'm I'm praying. I'm like looking at the mountains and I'm like I'm like God, why are you not big enough for the for like I look at other Christians. Why are you not big enough for other people? Why are they not burdened by sin? Why you know, and some of you who have been around me, you know, my mom can attest. I sat at her table and I said, why, mom? Why is God not big enough for everybody? You know, like as the trials came into my life, I would say, why does God not, you know, why is he not, nobody else has any faith, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I would kind of point my finger and I'd run and I'd say, wait, why, God? And, and the more I looked, like, at the man things, the more I was in this place of a dragon. My, my whole world was barren and dry. And, and it's funny, because I think, like, in, uh, like, mythologically, there's, like, it, in this layer of the dragons, there's these jewels there. You know, the, the dragon kind of gathers these jewels, and there's sort of these jewels underneath the dragon. And, and I kind of, like, see that as a representation of, like, those worldly... Like, whether it's worldly pleasures, or maybe it's like the sense of apathy that we, you know, can find ourselves in. But, but I felt like I was picking up those jewels and, ex like, in that place of the dragon and saying, you know, and I put it up to the light and I'd say, is this worth, you know, is this worth something? And then I would say, I, like, I knew as a saved person, those had no value to me, but they would, they did take my mind off of, what was going on for a moment. You know, I'd look at it and I'd say, maybe it was like, you know, scrolling through Instagram, just dumb stuff. It didn't have to be necessarily sinful, but, you know, it was just like I needed something. So I would look at those jewels that that, that dragon had. And, um, and so, um, I... Each of those things, I feel like God continued to bring people into my life. <laughs> Al the beggar at the commissary, <laughs> you know, um, like Donna, the the receipt checker. I seem to have a relationship with people at grocery stores, but you know, and and um, <laughs> they would, but they were like important to me because they would, even in the midst of all that, they would kind of like say, "Hey, God's thinking of you," you know. That that um, I don't think we can escape those things if if God is true in our life he will bring these weird things into our life to remind us he's real and he's a big God but so here I am running and saying where's God you know is he big enough for all these other people but what I didn't realize is that decision way back then I had said God's not big enough I had said God's not big enough and so there came a point really this summer where I kind of felt like the dragon in my life had said, you're going to either have to make a decision one way or the other. You know, apathy isn't really a thing. You're either going, you're going a direction, right? So, like, if you're not serving God, you're not serving God. You're, you're serving you're serving Satan. You're serving yourself, and that's the same thing. So, um... 
So this this summer I had to make a decision and I said I don't I don't know if I'm ready God I don't know if I can do this because I don't I don't have any strength like who am I you know I I don't want to go halfway back into church. I don't want to be, I don't want to fail you. And I don't want to, I don't want to be a bad testimony to the people around me, you know. So, and I don't want to be a hindrance. So some of you know, you've been a blessing to me. You've reached out to me. But I kind of, like Holly, bless your heart, you know, reaching out to me. And I didn't, but I didn't want to let my perspective that was wrong affect her. So, it's like I, I appreciated the blessing of Holly, but I also didn't want to, I didn't want to be um, a hindrance to her as well. So, um, so what, what changed? I kind of feel like uh, Ruth had a little bit of a part in that. She asked me to help in a Sunday school class, and, um, and I was like, okay, God, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to help, I'm going to, you know, I want to, I started reading the Bible like the, like eternity depended on it. I didn't want to be around these little kids and like have the wrong perspective. And, and it was about the creation story. And so I'm using all this time to, to study. And that was such a blessing to me. And it kind of took me all the way back to the beginning of my salvation and re making me realize he was big enough for me. He was big enough to save me. At, you know, way back when I was a sinner, way back then, he is the creator. And so it just uh, renewed my faith. And, and so... Um, so a couple things that like I took away from like as I was thinking about all these different situations in my life. Um, number one, you do have to be saved. You have to have a personal walk with God. I'm not saying that like that whole time I was walking close to Him, but if He didn't have His Holy Spirit in me, I wouldn't have had you know that that prompting to continue to to seek Him out. So it says in Romans 10:13, "If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe." Even thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We know that. I mean, it's like a no-brainer. I get it. You guys are all, like, super spiritual ladies. But at the same token, like, it's the truth. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, it's like a basic truth. Without that, I am thankful for my salvation. And so, and then, um, and I, through all this, I realized I truly am alone on my journey like with God, I like it didn't. I was alone. Like for a while, I had my kids, I had my husband, but I found myself without anything. I was alone in front of like a holy and living God, and He said, "What are you gonna do with me? You're in this desolate place. You're in this place of dragons. There's nothing there. What are you gonna do?" And I said, "Okay, what am I gonna do? I, I want you in my life. If it's just me and you." And I have nothing left. Everything else is burned to the ground. So be it. But I, but I, I I'm okay with with um, with that. So I mean, obviously we want all the good things that God gives us. But He is He is worth it all. So so um, and it, it, that's a great. There's a great responsibility in that. And there's also a great. Um, Peace in knowing that God, He says in Psalms 139, um, He says, David was talking here, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but but lo, O Lord, thou knowest altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend unto heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me no matter what I did God was there and um, and so I'm thankful for my salvation the fact that he knows me even when you guys didn't know what was going on in my life 
even those closest to me didn't know about that story about you know when I was out soul winning. But God did, and God knows, and He knows what what maybe where what desert you're in, and but this is like the other thing that he taught me that I'm not alone so that seems like a contradiction but it's it's just true so I am alone I stand before God my walk is my mine alone but I realized like I do have a blessing in all of you guys I do want to be exhorting and encouraged and and so um, and he and in Hebrews 10 24 it says and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching and it's easy to say you know I'm hurt by the people around, like in the church or I'm uh, you know I don't understand this situation in the church or whatever but he I mean he said we shouldn't do it and and I know I've been guilty so I'm I'm standing here saying don't do what I did because it was easy for me to step away and say you know I I could spiritualize it and say oh I don't want to be like a bad testimony you know you sing the song that says you know let me never ever outlive thy love for thee and I had prayed that you know and I was like okay I don't want to be like causing this place to look bad if I fail so anyway that that um, so you so you need to be saved you're alone on your journey with God and you're not alone on your journey with God and um, that's why we're meeting here today to encourage and exhort one another so God knew right where I was he knows my thoughts and my failings um, and I've I give him to those give him those every day I think part of it was my perspective. I, I borrowed all the troubles that were going to come in the future, and I said, I can see where I could fail out here. And instead of looking at God, I you know was focused on what could happen in in the future. And I just I got really excited by this, and so I want to kind of leave this thought with you. Um, these these I've been spending a lot of time in Isaiah and Proverbs. As I mean, and. Uh, but in Isaiah, I thought this was super cool. So here I am in this wilderness, and this is what I, if you want to turn to Isaiah 35. Um, I like this idea, this picture of this, this dragon. He, God set this, so I'm just going to read this while you guys are um, turning there. Isaiah 35, and um, it says... The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grown grass with reeds and rushes and as I'm walking through this desert place and I turn my eyes to Jesus I recognize that right there in that dry place this pool was like like it's there there is a there is a fountain you know and and these flowers start blooming around me so does that mean my problems went away no no but I see I see hope. I see that in that desert place, he allowed that spring to come forth. And it says in Psalms 34, uh, 12 through 14, it says, for, for God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the head of dragons in the water. Though, er, thou breakest the heads... 
of Leviathan in pieces and gave him, gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. So in my life, God took those dragons and I'm asking him to break the, their heads and feed me in the wilderness. That's like a weird picture, but I'm kind of excited, you know, like maybe he'll take and he'll and he'll kill those dragons in my life which could be apathy, which could be fear, which could be, um, you know, I don't know all the ways he's going to show me I've been sinning against him. And, and you know, I'll, I'll try to have more character. But, um, but he can take and break their heads and feed me in the wilderness. And I'm asking that he will do that in your life as well. That if you have any dragons in your life or any places that you um, find yourself in where there are those dragons, that he will... Um, he will break their head for you. So, uh, I did, so this sounds kind of strange, but I have these, I have these, um, magnifying glasses and it says oh come magnify the Lord with me let us exalt his name together I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of my my fears now if you're old like me these might potentially help you to see uh, makeup or something you know they always put the writing in like 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 the teeny tiniest little writing um, so um, I, and I'm gonna put these probably on your table when you guys are eating breakfast because it looks like breakfast is about ready but I do want to pray and I want to ask God not only for me to um, to never fail him, but again, <laughs> but um, but also that God will do a work in all of us. So if we can go ahead and pray, and um, we'll move forward. Dear God, Lord, I thank you that uh, what you've done in my heart through all uh, getting into your Word and. I just thank you for the blessing of salvation, for clarity of thought, Lord, for um, the joy you put in our lives. And Lord, I just pray that you will bless like the food that's getting ready to be eaten, as well as uh, our time of fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. I didn't even need my glasses. Wow. I'm impressed with that. <laughs> five minutes, okay. Wow, thank you very much, Rebecca. I think it's just amazing how the Lord um, ties in everything that, you know, is said in Women of Virtue. And he has done that with me preparing um, what I'm going to say today as well. And that was extremely helpful to me because we've all been there in the desert, you know, with the dragon. Um, and what do we do when we're there? And um, so Rebecca's testimony was just so helpful to me. And um, I'm also going to talk about that and what we can do when we find ourselves in that place. Um, and so we'll just take a break and we'll wait five minutes till breakfast is ready. And Rebecca already prayed for the food. It's ready? Okay, breakfast is ready. So thank you. We can eat breakfast. <laughs> Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, it just amazes me how, you know, when I was getting this lesson ready, and I wasn't sure if this is where I should go, but um, now after hearing Rebecca, I, it's just amazing how the Lord puts it all together. And so I'm going to be in John chapter 17 today. And reading this in my um, personal devotions just really um, struck me. And a lot of times when a woman of virtue is coming up, the Lord uses my personal devotion and something that affects me personally to give me something to share with you all. And um, so let's go ahead and pray first and then I'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all the ladies who are here today. And I pray that you calm my nerves and help me to just follow the leading of your spirit, Lord. I pray that I can help someone here today with what you have given me. And thank you so much for your word, Lord, and for all that you've done for me. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so first, I want to talk about... Um, encouragement when you're in the desert 
when you're with the dragon, uh, when your load is heavy. And um, let's begin with, and this is something I struggle with, let's talk about our purpose as women. First, our role as women, <laughs> excuse me, I have had allergies and asthma acting up, and so hopefully I won't cough too much. We are, as women, we are the kinder, gentler part of the world. <laughs> we are mothers, daughters, sisters, granddaughters, wives. The Lord has an amazing purpose for us in spite of ourselves. What we think we can do is irrelevant. The Lord has a purpose for us, and he can work mightily through us. When a man has a woman in his life, he has to slow down and listen. He has to be gentler and kinder. He may not always get it, but it must be done. <laughs> the Lord knew what he was doing when he put when he created woman to go women woman to go with a man. Okay. Now let's in John 17 Jesus is praying for his disciples because he's about to be crucified and he's leaving them physically. He will leave his spirit, but think about what that must have been like for the disciples. Christ knew what it would be like for them. Christ knows what is going to happen in our life. We hear that all the time, but in John 17 here, it really struck me how he knows what is coming up and we can be prepared for it. He knew the extremely difficult circumstances and discouragements coming their way. Here he is praying for the future difficulties in their lives. The Lord knows what will happen in our lives before we do. Have you ever thought when a tragedy strikes or, or anything just upsets your world? Have you ever thought, yesterday my life was so normal and mundane and now I wish it was that way again? We just don't know what tomorrow holds, but the Lord knows what tomorrow holds. The Lord knows, and He hurts for us before we are even hurting. He agonizes for our future pain. And He's doing that here in John chapter 17. So, I would encourage you to go back and read the whole chapter, but let's read verses 13 through 20. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So he's talking about the disciples, but here look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Here we are included. Here we are, you and I, placed in the same category as the disciples. Everyone is going to be believers. Um has future pain coming up. Lord knows it's going to hit us. He knows what it's like for us in our flesh. He knows things are going to hit us. They're going to be hard. We're going to fall. It's going to be hard to get up. And he agonizes for that. Even when it hasn't happened and our normal lives are taking place, Lord knows what's going to happen. Uh, many of you are homeschooling. <laughs> there are good days and there are bad days. You have a great day. Everything's going well. This is working. I love it. I'm happy. My kid's learning. Next day, you just never know when that's going to happen. It's so discouraging. It's not nothing. It's a serious thing. We have this responsibility of the children's education on our shoulders. I can tell you, just keep going. You're doing fine. I can tell you that by experience, and I've been there miscommunications in the relationships in our life. Everything's fine. We love them, whoever it may be. And then someone says something. Someone makes a face. Someone does something and about face in that relationship. 
you know, misunderstandings, same thing. You know, as women, uh, we have the hard burden of being so emotional and things really hit us and it's just hard to get out of that sometimes. And then as mothers, our kids, <laughs> who knows what's going to happen day to day with your kids. <laughs> um, Bethany and Heather were just recently here and they, they always tell us some stories that we don't remember. We don't remember that happening at all. <laughs> but Bethany and Heather are very different. Bethany's much more gentle-hearted than Heather is. And so the difference in these two stories were so funny. I was telling some ladies about this. Beth was telling us one day, now we were on deputation as missionaries, and so one evening my husband had to call a meeting and tell everyone, no more saying pee or poop. You will now say number one or number two. Because <laughs> we were in church after church after church. So and Bethany remembers this. She said, I just recently started saying poop again. And I was five when this happened. <laughs> That's how things affected her. You know, she was like, oh, don't worry. I will never say that word again, Daddy. <laughs> I'm so sorry to have disappointed you. And then Heather... And then, well, Bethany was telling us this story, which we did not remember this one either. Um, my husband got a jar out, and he said, every time you have a bad attitude, you're putting a quarter in. No. First thing Heather said was, well, that's stupid. <laughs> jar and then Bethany's like she lost a dollar in the first five minutes she, and, and the jar was for her so you know who knows what's going to happen from day to day with your kids oh and then hormones we struggle with hormones I have right now I know maybe you don't I do um, anyway, I have two men in my house right now, and sometimes they get blank stares. <laughs> you know, I'll be in the kitchen walking around talking, and they're sitting in the living room, and I'm like, hello, I'm talking to you, and they both just look at me. I know, you said, no, I heard you. You said something about red clouds in a tree? No, no, I did not say that. Maybe you should just listen when I'm talking. Ah, <laughs> oh, the poor men. Or if a female starts crying, oh, what do we do? I know my husband's like that, especially with his daughters. Like, I don't know. Go see what's wrong with them. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> And as mom, I'm usually like, oh, they're fine. <laughs> they know what they're doing here. Anyway, tragedies hit our lives. Deaths, illnesses. I remember, you know, we're talking about your life is normal, and then something hits it, and you just wish it was normal and mundane and boring again. Um, our family's been hit with suicide a lot. Sharon's husband committed suicide. Our daughter-in-law, Heidi, Daniel's first wife, committed suicide. And um, my brother has attempted suicide. And right now, he really has brain damage from it. It's amazing that he survived it. Um, it's just, we don't know what is coming in the future. However, the Lord does. He's already hurting for us. It just amazes me to think, you know, um, we had our normal day going to homeschool chapel, and then we found out what happened with Heidi and Enoch, and boom, everything just changed. The Lord already knew. He already knew what was going on. And the same thing here in John chapter 17. Um, so... Let's think about how valuable we are to Christ. He died for us. There's no greater show of love that exists in the universe that God created than someone dying for us. And that's what the Lord has done. We are valuable. We, in spite of what we think we can do, we can do what the Lord has for us. We can be a testimony to others. 
We can get up when we fall, and the Lord has given us many, many tools to do that. So I want to share with you some things that can help us to be encouraged. Um, we hear this, these things all the time, but I'd like to talk about them a little more so that we can see the value in these things and the value in ourselves. Um, like I said at the beginning, what we can do is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. We serve a Lord who has a plan for us. He can give us the strength, the power, everything to do what we need to do with our children, with our husbands, with all the relationships in our lives, with our mothers, the daughters. Um, and so we're still going to stay in John chapter 17. So first, let's see, I have one, two, three, four things here. Number one, stay in God's word daily. We all know this, but let's get some encouragement in this area. First, let's read verse 1 through 8. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou hast gave, gavest me. And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. God and his word are one. With God's word, we have the Lord to give us encouragement and love daily. Reading God's word is one way we maintain our closeness with Christ, our dear Heavenly Father who gave so much for us. The creator of the universe gave everything for us his very life. This is how one way that we can always remain close to Christ. As with all relationships, if you're not communicating, if you're not staying close to that person, that one, you're not even going to know what's going on. You're not going to hear them when they speak. <laughs> You're not going to know what to do. You're not going to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit. And staying in God's Word daily is one way that we can do that. The Lord knows what's going to happen. And He's walking with us through our life. And He knows what's coming up. And we're staying with Him and following His Spirit and reading His Word daily then he will be there to help us when we stumble and fall. Or when difficulties, discouragements, whatever hits us, hits us hard. We will know what to do. We will have his wisdom. We will be able to stop and turn to him and ask him what we should do. My daily Bible reading brought me to John 17 and this encouragement here. And it has really sustained me a lot. Um, number two, stay with a daily prayer time. Our Lord's example of prayer is the one we should emulate. His prayer has the proper, pure compassion for all of us. We, our flesh is tainted with all these different feelings about people and situations that we are praying about. But when we pray to the Lord, He has the proper, pure compassion for all of us, for everyone in our life, for all the situations. He has all the wisdom. And this way, we can get the unblemished, right answer to what we should do, what the next step should be. His praying to God the Father is pure and unblemished by the world. Let's look at verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And let's 
We'll look at verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And this, this, I remember reading this verse, them which thou hast given me, and I knew that that was me. I was given to the Lord. And that is so encouraging to me to remember that and remember that the Lord is right there and he knows what's going to happen in my life. Let's, re let's read verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Here we are in this world, in our flesh, in this sinful world, and the Lord's right here with us. Helping to keep us from evil. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. My favorite verse in this chapter that tells me that this applies to all of us. That the Lord prays for us and he prays what for what will happen in our life. And verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Even Jesus here talking about how God the Father loves him. And this love that is so good, it is all sustainable to us. It is what we need. It is all we need. It's what saved us. And that is just amazing to me. And I just love reading about that. So stay in God's word daily. Stay with a daily prayer time. We know that everything comes up, especially if you have kids, even if you don't, it's going to happen. Anything's going to come up to interrupt your devotion time, your prayer time. You've just got to do something to find, find the time to do it, whatever it takes. If you lose sleep, the Lord will give you rest. You know, it's, it's, it is something that needs to have top priority over everything. And yes, our flesh will fight tremendously. So, let's look at number three. Don't listen to worldly counsel. There are all these worldly sayings out there. You know, I see a big one a lot. Um, be a warrior as a girl, as a woman, you know. Um, Here's another one. Don't give the time of day to someone who doesn't like you or something to that effect. You know, you've seen them on social media, everywhere. These are not biblical. Worldly advice has a touch of truth, but mostly lies to make us feel better about having a bad attitude. You know what? Let me vent. This happened to me. And you know what? I'm a warrior. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is not humble at all. That is not Christ-like at all. That is a bad attitude. Christ exhibits humbleness while the world does not. If someone hurts you, it's okay to be angry, offended, offended, a warrior against wrongs done to you. No, this is not even close to Christ-like. Some would say you are letting people walk all over you. No. You've got the Lord there with you as you do the right thing and you have a humble attitude. That is the right response to anything like that. That is difficult to do. You know, it's hard when someone wrongs you or you think someone has wronged you, but you need to stay humble. We need to follow Christ's example. All these things will keep you close to the Lord and the one who knows what's going to happen in your life. The one who can keep you prepared for difficulties, help you get through them. Let's read verse 9 and 10. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. The one we want glorified is Christ, not ourselves. 13 through 16. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We are not of the world. We need to follow Christ's example, not the world's example. We need to humble ourselves and not let our flesh rear up. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. The Lord has sent us into the world. He has given us what we need to live in the world and still be Christ-like and still stand out. Verse 23, I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And let's read verse 25. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Don't listen to worldly counsel. Sometimes the feel-good worldly sayings and worldly counsel, you know, sounds a little biblical, but most of the time it's not because it's glorifying ourselves. And we want to glorify Christ and not ourselves. Number four, and the last one here. Beware of bitterness. Whatever your difficult situation, bitterness can take hold. Marriage difficulties, sibling relationships, parent and child relationships, all of these will have their times when being Christ-like and humble, staying close to the Lord will be necessary. A difficult battle with the flesh, but necessary. Sibling relationships, well, that's a hard one. You know, when you're growing up and your siblings get the best of you, oh man, that's one of the worst places your flesh can rear up. Um, that's a difficult one. But you need to be Christ-like and humble. The Lord knows. He knows your heart. And I mean that in a good way, not the Lord knows my heart, I'm okay. We're not okay, but the Lord does know your heart when you are trying to humble yourself and be Christ-like and do the right thing. You know you've got Him with you, even when there's no one else. He understands, and you're just trying to be humble and do the right thing. That's what you want to do. Pride. Pride goes right with bitterness. Recognize pride when it rears its ugly, ugly head. The fight against our flesh usually begins with pride, then anger, and then bitterness. We can stop it when we recognize pride and draw close to the Lord. When pride and bitterness are creeping up, go to the Lord. You probably won't feel like it. I never do. Usually I'm like, Lord... They did this to me. I'm really upset. And usually in the midst of that prayer, I realize I'm just letting my flesh just... When the Lord's there with you and you're in His presence, you can see. You can see clearly in the mirror, the mirror of God's Word and His Spirit that, mm, you know what? I'm wrong here. <laughs> but take a step towards the Lord and allow Him to work in the situation. Humbleness is so important. Let's look at verse 1 and 2, lastly, again. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. The one who should always be glorified is Christ. When Christ is glorified, it is pure and right. His power is shown. I do not need to be glorified ever. Only Christ. Remember what Christ has done for you. What he has done for us has given us more value and purpose than anything the world will ever give. More than anything our relationships will ever give us. Living in this sinful world, we will be discouraged, broken, defeated. Do not forget what the Lord has done for us. Let's remember to stay in the Word. Stay close to the Lord with prayer. Don't listen to worldly counsel and beware of bitterness and pride. 
He knows what is in our lives, past, present, and future. I just love this chapter where the Lord agonizes and prays for the disciples and us and the future difficulties that we might have. And that's all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for everyone who's here. And thank you, Lord, for your word, for dying on the cross for us and for praying for us and knowing what is coming up in our lives. Lord, we forget about you so often, but you are always thinking about us. And Lord, I pray that you be with all of us, with everything we're going through, with what will happen in the future, and help us to deal with things that have happened in the past as well. Lord, thank you so much for loving me and saving me. In your name I pray. Amen. I have even some visitors here with us. We're glad that you're here. And, and again, some might wonder why... Uh, the pastor is speaking at a ladies meeting and, and, and actually goes back to New Guinea. Um, I was, we had the missionary in the other island. Been, he's been in New Guinea. You met him. We support him now, the Crots, since 1980, I think it was when they arrived in New Guinea. And uh, anyhow, he'd asked me to come preach at a ladies meeting. And it's their biggest meeting of the year. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And what they do is during the day, they have all the sessions with the ladies from morning, then afternoon sessions. And then the evening is preaching uh, every evening during it. And uh, so I went there and I'd actually preached it a couple of times while I was there. And anyhow, and he had told me this, but then I heard it from, I just don't know how many had come up to me afterwards and said, and they said, ever since they switched to that format, they love it, where they still get a sermon um, at the end of it. And uh, they really enjoyed it. So I knew even coming in here, that was my goal since the very first one. It's just nice when it gets to me. There's been plenty of times when the speaking goes on and, and it never actually gets to me. But, uh, um, and, uh, but Exodus, Exodus 14, before I get to that, I do have sort of a way that I need a lady's help in church and then we'll read and I'll get into this. This is separate from everything here. But since we did have the ladies, there's something I want to address. I've been here now uh, seven years. Seven years. Over seven years that I have been here. And this has come up a minimum of three times in my mind right now I'm certain of. And it's probably a few more times than that. And I know it's never, never on purpose, never with any intent that this takes place. But I, I definitely need the ladies' help with visitors. Um, I really do. I've had a recent one. This is why it's on my mind. I've had a, I've had a, a visitor that had let me know of her experience in our church. And this is the, like I said, this is the third time this has happened. Um, at least. It's just three times in my mind. And she said she thought that I ought to know. And said she was in the nursery um, with her child. And understand, it's already awkward. You, when you're at a church visiting, that's awkward. You need to put yourself in their place. I don't think any of our ladies do this on purpose. I just don't think we're conscious of it in the moment. All right. She said, I'm in the nursery. Two ladies are talking. And they quickly said, hello. It was really nice and friendly. But then they just went right back to their conversation. She said, I was just there. She said, to be honest, it was really, really awkward. She said, I felt out of place, like I shouldn't even be there right now. When you have a visitor, uh, and we are, we have a friendly church. We do. We get that all the time. We do. We're just not thinking of it. Go out of your way for those visitors. And talk to them. Ask them, where are you from? How'd you find out about the church? Are you married? How many kids? What do you do for school? Get to know them. And she said, she'd asked the husband, uh, um, you know, after service, you know, how was, how, how did you like it? He said, I, I really did like the church service and the, and the preaching and whatnot. But, he, but she told him about the experience in the nursery. Well, we'll go back next week. And she said, Pastor, the same thing happened the very next week in the nursery. Um, and again, things along that line, that's been the third time in seven years that that's come to me. Um, something along those lines that has taken place. I don't think it's on purpose. I don't know one of our ladies meaning it ever struggles off visitors. What I'm asking you to do is be conscious of that. 
Go out of your way to be helped, especially to the ladies that are visiting. Um, make them feel welcome. Have those conversations with them. Because, you know, I, I do. I believe our church, we have a lot going on. We could be a help to those families. And, and no doubt there's many families that we've lost opportunities to minister to because of things like that taking place. So be aware of that um, and uh, go from there. But anyhow... Exodus 14. Exodus 14. Pastor, yes. Did this woman, is she still here with us? Um, I, I'll leave that off in case they come back because they, they certainly don't want to know who they are or anything like that. So I'll leave that information out. No, but have they, have, are they still here with us? Um, like I said, that I'll avoid. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll avoid answering that for right okay. now. Okay. And, uh, um, but uh, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Exodus chapter 14. Uh, we have the event here that takes place. Now, this is something that I did. This is one of the messages that I actually did for the, the men of faith. And I've tweaked it slightly. Very little did I have to really edit and change for this. And it fits right in. Matter of fact, I almost preached. And, it, and this fits more into that. I almost preached. Uh, I was debating between two lessons from the desert, actually, wherever Rebecca is. Because um, Moses had to learn a lot in the desert after he had failed. Um, I was going to do lessons from the desert. And this is the result after he learned his lessons from the desert is what we're going to look at here today. But Exodus chapter 14. This is, we're not going to read all of this, but this is one major event that takes place. This is the Red Sea. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Belzephon, before it ye shall encamp by the sea. So the Lord's directing them to a very specific location, Belzephon. That's where he wants them. Matter if you look on the map, the Lord actually had him go kind of go a little bit past it and sends him right back into this particular place. Verse 3, he gives the reason why. For Pharaoh will save the children of Israel. They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt, and the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he purposed after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them uh, encamping by the sea beside Piharath before Belzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and beheld, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in the wilderness. Wherefore hast thou dared to carry us forth out of Egypt? And we come down hard on the children of Israel here because of the response, you know, they, all they had seen. And, I, and I'll address this more. But remember where they've been raised so far. They've been raised in Egypt. And the Lord knows that. He knows their heart. He knows where they're at spiritually. He knows what needs to take place in their life. Their response to this is not a shock to God. Verse 12, they continue. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? Saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, and stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, now Moses, there's, there's really good principles of leadership here. I want you to notice something about this verse. I'm not going to preach on it. I just want to point it out right now. Here is Moses strong before the people. The Lord will fight for you. You will see the salvation of the Lord. But look what Moses was doing in his heart. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? <laughs> he was strong before the people. He was showing the leadership he needed to. But in his heart, he's like, Lord, please, <laughs> please, please, please. He said, Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Is that which direction? But lift thou up thy rod. And stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud, remember they were marching, the army of, of the Egyptians were. And the pillar of cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. Now we, a little bit of time passes, they're passing through. It says, and the Egyptians, so the cloud is moving, it's before them, leading them on. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning, watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud. And you never want the Lord to say this about you. And troubled the host of the Egyptians. The Lord could have just caused the water to come down. But he wanted just a few seconds for them to pause and realize what's taking place, where this is from. And it says, and took off their chariot wheels, and they drave, and they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, here's what he was going for, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the water may come again upon the Egyptians, and upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, and there remained not so much as one of them. Incredible. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray for your mercy and your grace and your help. Lord, please direct what I say and how I say it. Help me to stay true to your word. And Lord, I pray that your word would be a help to all the ladies that are here. Lord, to strengthen them spiritually, to draw them closer to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified and honored in all that's said and done. Lord, I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, <clears throat> this is without a doubt one of the most amazing miracles that takes place in the Word of God is the parting of the Red Sea. I've said it from the pulpit many times and I've made reference to it, although I've never preached directly on this in, in the church service. It's, it is definitely one of those miracles that I cannot wait to get to heaven and, and watch, whether you download it from a heaven cloud or something like that or a DVD room, whatever it is. I want to watch when this thing took place. It's just so astounding. 
It's astounding what it took for Moses to get to this place in his life. He's over 80 years old now. First 40 years he spent in Egypt. Um, and his life changed in a single moment in time on a failure. On a failure. He sort of got ahead of God. What he desired to do was right, but the timing was off and his method was off. He wanted to deliver them. He saw, he knew who he was. He, here's the guy that's in line to be the next Pharaoh. He would be next. He ends up murdering an Egyptian. That event would change the course of his life. The next day when two Hebrews were fighting, he's trying to intervene once again. Again, he had, he had a right motivation. He saw, he saw how, how his own brethren, how they were abused and mistreated. He wants to deliver them from it. But he got ahead of God, and he used the wrong method. He murders the guy, finds out, and the next thing you know, he finds himself in a desert. Finds himself in a desert. He would learn several critical lessons in the desert about how to handle failure. We move forward. Forty years pass that he's been in the desert, and God's call comes to his life. He's now married. As far as he knows, he's 80. He's content. This is his life. Married, children, he's over 80 years old. This was my life as far as, he's, as far as he's concerned. But he has no clue actually what God has in store for him. None. He has lived these 40 years in complete obscurity. From the prince of Egypt to obscurity. And the good thing was he did learn contentment right there. If this is what God has, this is what he has. But then, in the burning bush, the call comes. Moses is stunned. His life has been set, and now God is calling him? Moses gives several excuses why this cannot be possible. We see something in Moses in this cycle that's true of all of us in many ways. We see when we look in overview of his life, we see that he ran before he was ever sent. He retreated after he fell. And he resisted when the call actually came. So Moses here is hearing from the Creator Himself, and Moses resists the calling of God. God called Moses, and Moses said, Who am I that I should go? And you see something Moses learned, a key trait that's gonna, he's going to need, meekness and humility. The great leaders that God uses are going to have the attributes of meekness and humility. Moses had to learn that when God does call, when it's God, he qualifies. But Moses continued with his next excuse. But what shall I say? Who is sending me? What a ridiculous excuse. And this is actually Moses, not so much doubting in God, but in himself. He needed to learn how God's power and strength, that God was the key, not him. He doesn't need all the answers. He simply needs God. Many times we think we need all the answers before we obey God's call. No. The biggest answer you need to know is simply that God's in control. He said, well, what if they don't believe me? Basically, he's saying, what if they don't respect me? Again, needing to trust God. And God at this point shows his power by using what Moses had in his hand, his staff. And God will always use whatever is in your hand. Whatever he's given you, it's there for a reason. Moses still continued. But I can't speak. I'm, I have a slow tongue. And I am proof that God can use you even if you can't speak. That was funnier when I wrote that down, but I guess it didn't hit all that well. Some things I think that'll be funny just are not. Again, Moses needing to get eyes off of self and on God. And he's going to do just that. Moses did obey and he did go. 
And we see Moses used in a tremendous way. You see a man who was much different than 40 years earlier. And he would need that knowledge he needed in Egypt a lot. I mean, how God in his sovereignty put all this together is amazing. God certainly would use Moses to help deliver his people out of Egypt, just like Moses desired all those years ago when he was looking on his brethren. They witnessed amazing things taking place. All the plagues from the blood, the darkness, the frogs, the, the, the lice, and, and, and of course that incredible event that where the Lord established the Passover. And all that that pictured with the shedding of the blood, the blood on the door, and that all you needed to do to be saved from death was to be under that blood, inside a house where the blood was applied. Boy, what the Lord was establishing was incredible. That would be in place until the night of the arrest and the betrayal. So they head out of Egypt. Chapter 13, God is leading them. It says in verse 18 of chapter 13, But God led the people through the way of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, um, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So they're directly led by God. We know a pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. Just incredible. But where the Lord leads them is what I want to drive at today. He leads them to a called Belzephon. Really, when you look at this, there could not have been a worse location. Literally, there would be no way out from where the Egyptians are going to be, where some mountains were. There is no way out where they went. It's as if, uh, not as if, it's what God did. God put them in a corner. Remember, when Pharaoh got the report, they're where? Oh, we got them. Get the army. There are times in life that we find ourselves in horrible jams between a, like different sayings we use for them, a rock and a hard place, where there just doesn't seem to be a right answer, where there just doesn't seem to be a way out of the difficult situation that you find yourself. It kind of, kind of like being a, an attorney who specializes in medical malpractice and you're known for it. And all of a sudden you find yourself needing major medical surgery. That guy's in trouble. <laughs> Again, I thought there'd be more, more laughs there. I'm just going to delete anything that calls for a laugh here because it's just not working. <clears throat> and maybe you're in one of those places now between a rock and a hard place. Maybe because of a bad decision, you find yourself in a difficult time where there just doesn't seem the right answer. Maybe there's a circumstances that have rose and you're just not certain. What's, what do we do? There just doesn't seem to be a right way. I know even in counseling, many times, much of the counseling simply deals with just issues like that. Very difficult situations where there just doesn't seem to be a right answer that's clear. Maybe it's with a child. Maybe it's with a spouse. Maybe it's something at work. But whichever way it is you turn, you just don't think you can see the right answer. Well, put yourself in Moses' place. Here he is. God's leading. God hasn't told the whole story yet, though. He did not tell Moses exactly what he was going to do. Moses does not have that knowledge. But it's not just Moses. He has, we don't know the exact number, but it's huge. We know this. It is between one and two million Hebrews that are being let out. One to two million And God put them right in this place, right in a corner, with an army after them. And again, maybe you find yourself in a Belzephon. But you know what you got to remember? You got to remember Exodus 13. God led them there. 
It's where God put them for a reason, for a purpose. But why does God lead us to these places? Why is it in life? Life is, the success of life is not based on joy and having all that you want in a nice house. That's not what, that, that's not what makes it. It's, it's how you handle the difficulties of life. It's how you handle the challenges of life. So why does God take us to Belzephon? Why does he put us in places where there appears to be just no way out? So what I want to look at today is why God leads us sometime to a Red Sea. To some impossible situations. As we saw in chapter 14, when they arrived in Belzephon and Pharaoh hears about it, he sends the army. And how the Lord allowed all this to develop and what he was going to do. So here's the children of Israel. They're there, and all of a sudden, they're encamped out here. The Red Sea is right there. They've got a mountain range on one side. There's only one way back out of this place. That's it. And all of a sudden, they hear rumblings. Egypt caught up. There's literally an army ready to kill. They're marching. We got you. We got you. And they start. They go after Moses. Moses, we told you, leave us alone. Just leave us in Egypt. We're going to die here. They didn't see a way out. A lot of times, I remember times I've read that over and over and thinking, I'm surprised God just didn't kill him right there. What in the world? <laughs> but you know what? God understood how they thought. He knew exactly how they viewed life. He knew this is one to two million people who grew up in Egypt. They have, outside of what they did just witness, and it was impressive with the plagues, but apart from that, they've never seen God work. There's no Bible to read. It doesn't exist yet. Not one word. He knows right where they're at. And so all of a sudden, though, you know, Moses gives that amazing address to them about, you know, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord shall fight for you. And then, you know, they had to have, they had to have a glimmer in their eye all of a sudden when that pillar of cloud picks up and encamps behind him and stops the marching army. They're in darkness now. They have light. Incredible. And then there's Moses, and he stretches out that simple staff over the water in an east wind that had to be pretty impressive. It comes into the sea, and I've been to the Red Sea. Uh, I've, I've snorkeled there. I got the worst sunburn of my life I've ever had because I forgot to put sunscreen on my back while I'm snorkeling in the Red Sea when it's 130 degrees out. <laughs> bad day. <laughs> Even the one fish that's in my tank, the, purple, the big purple one, it only comes from one place in the world, the Red Sea. That's where they're from. And so they're watching this east wind hit. And it's creating right before their eyes. Nobody's sleeping, by the way. Everybody is watching this take place. I don't think there's a whole lot being spoken. But as the seconds pass by, God is getting glorified more and more. You know what they're realizing? There's a way out. Walls of water are forming on both sides. Not only that, it's producing dry ground. There's one to two million people that need to cross. This just isn't a little path. This is huge. And then all of a sudden, Moses gives the command, let's go. We're crossing. And they head in. I mean, that would be amazing. I mean, you can imagine every single one. I mean, again, if, if the corn kids were there, their hands are in that water all day, the whole time. They're just, they're just in that water the whole time going down there. That's what they're doing. <laughs> Moses, get your hands out of the water. <laughs> But everybody will be just amazed and staring at it and all. But it would get better. They're crossing. 
Pharaoh makes a really bad decision. Head in. He sends his entire army in. Chariots, his infantrymen, they're all in there. They're on the other side looking back. And the Lord wants them to look back. And in this nation that was the world leader of the time, the dominant nation, the Lord's going to change it in a moment, in a second. And the Bible says, again, the walls just could have came down of water, could have came down, it's over with. But he didn't do it that way. He wants that moment. He troubles them. And the chariot wheels just pop off. Could you imagine this being there if you're in the Egyptian army? And I don't believe it was just a matter of like two or three seconds and it came down. No, 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 no. I, I believe there's a, a little bit of time right there. The wheels come off. Boom. And they know. I mean, every single chariot wheel at the exact same moment just popped off. And then as the Bible tells us, what their thought was this. We're actually fighting against the true God. We're not going to win. It's over with. At that moment, whew, the waters came down. And the nation of Israel just saw their enemy defeated like that. And they understood the truth of Moses' words in that moment. The Lord fought for you. They did nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> so I want to look at lessons from what just took place in Exodus chapter 14. So we can learn why it is that God puts us in a bell -sophon. Three things I'm going to give you. He does it for three reasons. To change us, to challenge us, and to condition us. First off, He does it to change us. There's much that the Lord needs to accomplish with this nation of one to two million people. They are His nation. Understand what's at stake here. The nation of Israel represents God on earth at this point in time. They are His people. They are the one group of people in the entire world that has truth. They represent God. Yet they've been in Egypt for all these years. And now they're coming out. I mean, I, I, and the Lord knows there is so much to change about them. So much he has to change in their life. And the events at the Red Sea will serve significantly in changing the children of Israel. They have physically left Egypt, but as we know, that did not get Egypt out of them. The Lord wants Egypt out of them. I mean, you think of the wickedness of our world today as the churches are going the other direction in trying to bring the world back in. But the Lord knows, I've taken them physically out of Egypt, but now the challenge is Egypt is in them. It affected how they thought. It affected how they worked, how they talked, how they dressed, how they lived. God just wasn't saving them from the physical bondage that they were at in Egypt, but He also has to save them from the influence of Egypt in their life. In order to do that, the Lord knows this. It has to start with a paradigm shift in thinking, which means dramatic, huge. Usually, in order to produce a paradigm shift in somebody's thinking, a dramatic event needs to take place. That's what the Lord's going to use the Red Sea to do. He will use the Red Sea. He uses those times in our life, those significant events that in a moment in time change how you view life and how you view God. But if you're not in a Belzephon, that can't take place. 
This is what begins to produce change in our life. I don't know if you know the story of what led to the decision by Harry Truman to use a nuclear bomb. It's fascinating. Um, there's a book that deals with it. It's different. There's a Hollywood movie out. I've never seen it. But there's a Hollywood movie by the same name. They came out after it. And so it confuses people because you can actually buy the, the wrong book that deals with the story. It's called Flyboys. But you have to get the one that the older version of it. And it's, it's an interesting book. It deals even when George Bush, the first George Bush, was shot down and rescued in the sea. It's fascinating stuff. And it gets into detail about Truman's decision to use a nuclear weapon. Atomic weapon, I should say, I guess. And the problem was, we knew we had Japan. But if we sent in troops, the, the military intelligence, the generals of the time had determined we would need one million soldiers to overtake Japan at great cost. Because, here was their thing, here was the problem. They actually believed the emperor was divine. They believed he was divine. That presented major problems. Get this. Their worldview was what they were fighting against. Because they knew if we go in, they're, they're not going to be, I mean, everybody's going to be picking up a weapon. Everybody, not just the soldiers. They're going to give their life for their divine emperor. And they knew that. And so Truman had the alternative of a nuclear uh, atomic weapon, I should say. And he actually knew this will save lives to end the war. And by the way, he was right. And when they discussed it, this is what they came to the conclusion. We have to produce a paradigm shift in how they think. And they believed that an atomic weapon would produce how they viewed the world. It worked. When the second one was dropped, the paradigm shift occurred. You know what they realized in that moment? It wasn't just the surrender. It was the nation realized our emperor is not divine. They had what they needed. The surrender was immediate. But it took an event like an atomic weapon to produce the paradigm shift. There are times the Lord puts us in those really tough places so that you have no choice but, but to wait to see what the Lord does so it can produce a paradigm shift in how you think. Think of the children of Israel here, what they just witnessed. Think of how they viewed the world on the other side of the Red Sea. And then what they just witnessed, and now here they are, the water is back. When they began marching, I mean, they, they're still have a lot to work out. We can go through this whole time frame in the wilderness to see what, you know, what was taking place. But nonetheless, they viewed God and the world differently. They had much more, if you will, of a biblical perspective when they walked away. The truth is, God needs to get the world out of us. Its influence is everywhere. It affects us in ways just like the children of Israel. They don't even know. That's where God always shows us grace and mercy. There's times He knows, kind of like we talked about with Jonah. There's times we don't know our right name from our left. We don't even realize how much the world's philosophy affects us. So at times He'll put us in these difficult places, these bad predicaments, to where we can see Him work and it changes how we think. We see the all God puts us in a place where we can look nowhere but to Him. We can see how great and powerful He is, and it changes us how we view God and the world. It gets the world out of us. See, again, we underestimate the, the amount of influence the world has on our life. I mean, I, being a pastor, I get fascinated by different churches, of course. And this is always, we can see such worldly philosophy in our independent Baptist churches. We can. And it's like it's not even recognized. I mean, we have independent fundamental Baptist churches that for decades have been completely driven by pride. And they think it's godly. It's the philosophy of the world that is so entangled that they control their church based upon pride and use pride as a motivator. 
or the churches that have a different view of the world from a Western culture where it's ran like a company. The pastor is the CEO. We have our board of directors. It's business decisions. Worldly philosophy affecting God's people. And there are times the Lord to change that. No, he'll do. He'll come in and put you in a belsophon. You got to change how you think. The Lord desires to change us. We know that from Romans 12, 1 and 2, other places throughout. He genuinely desires to mold and make you into the image of His dear Son. For you. He knows what that will do for you. He knows what the, how that, the strength that will give. Again, life is not about all joy and happiness. It's not. It's about how we handle the, the, the difficulties of living in a sin-cursed earth. How we handle the challenges of life. I can think of different key moments in my life. Uh, for instance, the story of the... And I'm going to get into a couple st different stories. Uh, I've probably told these you know, a couple times before. But when we started debutation, think of the timing of this. The Lord knows I'm the guy from Cleveland. And he's going to put me in the jungle. Just Again, to me, that's just a really bad idea. And so it's the very first few days of debutation. We've just left Alaska. We're in our motorhome full time. We pull out. And little did I know, Marianne will tell you, when we drove by Buffalo Mine Road in the motorhome, my thought was at the time, little did I know, I'd be back here. I remember my thought was, wow, this is it. We are completely done with Alaska. Uh, never thinking I would return to live. I knew on furloughs, but I thought that was it. Little did I realize how horrible the very first seven days were going to be. I won't get into all these for time's sake here, but the snowstorm from, I was preaching Friday night in Haines. No, Friday and Saturday night in Haines. Sunday morning, keep in mind, Sunday morning, I'm preaching in Whitehorse. So Friday night, Saturday night, preaching in Haines. Sunday morning in Whitehorse, and I am driving a 28, 29 foot Class C motorhome. Not good planning. A snowstorm hits the Saturday night. We are to leave Haines. We have to go through that mountain pass, whatever it is. We have to go through that pass in the snowstorm. It went slow, slow, slow. We basically pulled in in time for the morning service, and I'm preaching all day. We leave there. We hit another snowstorm immediately. It was horrible. This one was much worse than that one. We're going through a pass. You know the story. I've come up on a trucker. We can see that. I am doing that. I'm not exaggerating. You ask all the kids. They'll, they'll never forget this. I'm doing five miles an hour going up a mountain. It's snowing so heavily. My windshield wipers cannot keep up. We're having trouble seeing the road. And we're on a mountain. I mean, there's cliffs edges over here. And I come up on a truck. You're not going to worry about other traffic. There's a trucker who's just stopped. I pull up beside him. And we get out and we talk. And he said, he goes, you got chains? I said, I don't have chains. And he had said, I don't think you should go up it. I think you should wait this out. And I'm like, man, i got so many meetings right now. My schedule is packed. And so we got in. And, and it's so funny because all my kids are small. Bethany's four. Daniel was 10 at the time. They're all, all around the driver's seat. And while I'm driving, just barely, just trying to get through it, trying to get through it, trying to get through it. And just... And it took hours, which should have taken, you know, probably 45 minutes, hours to get through it. And sure, the Lord blessed. We got through that. And on the other side down, there had to be a little lodge. And I knew we're on the downhill side. So like, we got it now. I, I got out of the motor. I went out. I went and stayed in the lodge. I'm not sleeping in the motorhome. I went in that lodge. Went in the lodge and slept that night. So that was Monday into Tuesday. Wednesday, headed into a church. I'm preaching at a church that Wednesday in Winnipeg. We're a few hours out. That's when Daniel cut his thumb. Boop. You can see this. If he's still here, you can go look at a scar. Um, I'm driving down the road. Marianne's sleeping in the passenger seat. All of a sudden, I, still he I hear Heather screaming her head off. I mean, as loud as she can scream. I have no idea what took place. Marianne jumps up and goes back there. And, and I look back, and she says, we've got to get to a hospital. Daniel's thumb is off. Daniel got my utility knife out. Heather had asked to have a tag cut off one of her dolls. And so he went to cut it, and he slipped. And he took that knife just perfectly through his joint capsule. Whoop. And the thumb went. Whoop. That's why Heather was screaming. 
And so I call the missionary up, let him know, where's the nearest hospital? Here's my look. He said, you got to come all the way in here. So we're still a couple hours out. So we get in there. We get to the hospital he directed us to. Drop Mary and Daniel off. I head back. I'm trying to get in the parking lot. they got stupid, those stupid gate things you pull the ticket for. As I get through, I hear a little bump. I'm like, oh. Didn't think much of it until I got out. I get out and look. And the back seam of the motorhome, where the, from the back, when it turns right here, that seam coming down was ripped open. I could just about get in through. I'm not seven days into debutation yet. The driving has been horrible. I had horrible planning. My son's thumb is off, and I just ripped open our home. And I'm leaning against the side of the motorhome, and Heather comes around, and she's just a little girl at the time, and she looks up and says, Daddy, what's wrong? <laughs> And it goes, you got to be like Moses, you know, stand still and see what God will do. <laughs> I just said, nothing. <laughs> Everything's fine. And I called Pastor Roach up. And at first, I was really dicked. I called him up, just told him everything that had happened. And he starts laughing. <laughs> I want to say, this is a time, you know when you went to school for pastoral theology and they mentioned compassion? <laughs> this is where that chapter kicks in. <laughs> but then he gave, without a doubt, the greatest advice he'd given to me since I've been a member of the church. He had said, he said, sounds like the Lord's getting you ready for New Guinea. And so, in hours, every problem would be solved. I head into the hospital. Marianne's still panicking. said, they're not even looking at him yet. So I start pitching a fit in the hospital with a nurse. A doctor hears me arguing with her. He comes up. So what's the problem? I said, you know, do you not do, what's that called, uh, triage? I said, my son should, be, should not be sitting in a waiting room right now. I said, it's been a couple hours. He cut his thumb off. And he goes, well, let me see it. He goes, oh, okay. Yeah, bring him on back. <laughs> and so he went right back. And so they looked at him, and he came. He finally said, "Listen, you need a you need a children's hand surgeon. We don't have, by this time it's about nine ten at night. By the way, okay, on a Wednesday night, he said we don't have one here. He goes, there's another hospital in town. He goes, I've already called the children. They have one children hand surgeon. He's still there. He wants to look at him tonight." And I said, I'll take him there. So I head out. The missionary I was going to be preaching for that night is standing there. And he, he, first thing he said to me, well, he asked how, how my son was. I said, we're getting ready to move him to this other hospital. And he goes, is that your motorhome out there? I said, yes. He goes, oh. <laughs> he has a church counting children of about 25 people counting children. Okay, 25. And he said, you're not going to believe this. He goes, there's a guy in my church that owns an RV body repair shop. He said, I'll take you there in the morning. And so that night, we head over to the other hospital, um, and we meet the hand surgeon. He looks at his hand and goes, wow, this is a really clean cut. He goes, because it was a razor blade. So went right through, this is really clean. He goes, he goes I'm going to try and do the surgery right now. He goes, he goes the issue is the, is the tendon. He says, find the tendon. It's like a rubber band. He goes, if I can find the tendon quickly on this side, he goes, I can get this done really quick. If not, we'll have to come back in tomorrow. It'll be a little bit more involved surgery. So I said, great, do it. Take him back. Probably an hour later, Daniel comes out. He's cast it up and done. He goes, piece of cake, it's done. Then the missionary takes us to his house. We sleep on his living room floor that night. And uh, the morning, we get up, we bring the motor home to the RV body repair shop, and the guy looks at it, and he says, actually, I can get this done pretty quick if you want me to do it how I want to do it. And I said, how do you want to do it? He goes, I just want to take sheet metal and run it up the side. I said, do it. <laughs> and so he did. He just bent sheet metal up, ran it right up the side, riveted it down, and I was on the road by noon the next day. Now, listen to me, though. How I viewed God changed from 24 hours earlier. Do you know what, he, know what he needed to do? Get me ready for New Guinea. So he had to put me in a Belzephon. And say, watch, I'm going to show you what I can do. There's times the Lord does things. He puts us in those places so he can change us. So he can change us. We have much more of the world that needs to come out of us than what we realize. He puts you in those situations where you just have to look up. Secondly, second and third one will go quicker. To challenge us. To challenge us. 
Verse 13 and 14 of chapter 14, Moses said this to the children of Israel. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. What Moses told them was, you are going to witness God fighting for you. Now, you might not believe this, but this is very true. I believe this to be one of the hardest lessons for a Christian to learn, is that God fights for you. Because we like to do it ourselves. And there's several reasons why that comes into play without us even realizing it, because of how much the world influences us, and we don't even see it. For men, how I address this with the men, it's a little bit different for the ladies, but for the men, one of the reasons it's hardest for us to accept is the truth is, we like the glory. We want a part in it. We just don't want it to be all God. We want to say... You know, we like to say, I like to thank God. Don't, don't you love I like to thank God, and then they just go on everything they did. <laughs> because men have ego problems. But then let's come to the female side. And by the way, there are differences between men and women, and it's not hard to define what a woman is. It isn't. I've created my own definition, but I will not give it out because I might not make it out alive. <laughs> but you know why sometimes it's hard for the ladies to learn that God fights for you? Anxiety and worry, fretting, wanting an element of control to see it, how it can happen. It's a difficult lesson to learn that God fights for us. But when he does, he gets the glory. We see his power and it strengthens our faith. So he does it. Secondly, puts us in a bell saphon to challenge us to trust him. He puts us in those difficult places so he does get the glory in your life and it strengthens your faith. It does. There's nothing else that will strengthen your faith like a bell saphon. Nothing. I mean, I want you to think about this. The children of Israel no doubt needed their faith strengthened. And how you handle it isn't the same for everybody. I'm going to give you an example with what just took place here. I want you to think about two men that witnessed it that night. Not Moses. Two men of the one to two million who saw what God did. Caleb and Joshua. They were there. They saw the wall of water. They saw what God did. In just a matter of a few weeks, it's not a long time, in just a matter of a few weeks, they're going to be among 12, looking into the promised land and seeing giants. Here's how the Belsophon changed Caleb and Joshua. When Caleb and Joshua saw the giants they were facing, it was as grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. Sometimes God puts you in a bell savant, so when those giants come in your life, it looks more like a grasshopper to you. He's preparing you for what else comes ahead. He does it to challenge you to trust Him. I mean, Joshua and Caleb, they were ready to go. It, 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 it wasn't even an issue for them. Why? What made them different? How they handled Belsaphon. What they saw God do. They were changed. They were challenged. They saw God work. Many times the trials of today prepare us for the giants of tomorrow. The truth is life is all about glorifying God. God will put us in situations where He can receive glory. He'll do it on purpose just so you're there. I, I mean, you, you've heard the story where I'm coming back, I'm by myself in, the, in a supply run from the one island back to our island. And everything's going fine. I always enjoyed the boat rides. It's just a small boat. Again, there's no just little banana boat. 40 horse motors, all that's on it. And I always enjoyed it when the ocean was calm. I mean, the dolphins would come out. They'd do flips. Whales would come up by the side of the boat. It was incredible. But when the sea was rough, I didn't want near the water. But it was a calm day. Everything was great. We're coming back, and there's usually several people on the boat. Usually they're packed, but it's just me and the boat operator. Jonah. Don't ever go on a boat with a guy named Jonah. How stupid was that? 
and, and we're coming back and Jonah takes a break and he turns the engine off and I always hated that because I have been stuck out there where they can't get the engine started. Um, it, remember, it's well over 100 degrees. You're sitting on the ocean. There's no shade. It's just no fun. And so I'm sitting, I got my cargo all covered up in a, in a tarp and I'm leaning against it and I'm just a few feet from him. So I'm sitting down here. He's just about right here. No, the boat's running this way. I'm facing this way. And, and so he goes to start it up and he goes to pull. It's just a pull start. He goes to pull start it and there's a little bit of water that come in the boat. I'm going to hit you right in the head. I know it. <laughs> and, uh, and that's because your kid was sticking your hand in the water. <laughs> Um, he goes to pull start and he slipped and so I'm, this is right this is this far from me he slipped and his hands like go flying and he hit the key and the key goes boom right in the ocean I was like oh. <laughs> and he didn't do anything he just jumped right in the ocean boom I'm like <laughs> and I'm stunned I can't believe what just happened I'm sitting in the boat the operator's gone the key is gone and I'm from Cleveland it doesn't work well <laughs> And, and I, I just began praying, Lord, please. <laughs> and it's just, you're the most, you're, that, that's all you're hearing. And it seemed like, again, it seemed like a good hour, but it was only about 20, 30 seconds. And he pops his head out of the ocean side of the boat. I'm looking at him. He smiles, and he had the key. <clears throat> That challenged me in those several seconds greatly. But it, once again, it challenged me that I can't trust him. Because in a moment, I thought, oh, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm going to roast out here in the sun. I still didn't miss the cold, but nonetheless. <laughs> But our life is about glorifying God. So he will put us in situations. Just like when he popped out and showed the key. I guarantee you God was glorified in my mind right in that moment. He'll put you in situations in Belsophon. Where when he does do something. Because it, there seemed to be no way out. He is glorified. That's how that works. He'll also use it to strengthen your faith. So that when you see God work, you're just in awe. And those moments, they do cause a jump in your faith in God. God wants us to see His power. He wants us to see His working. He desires that. Let me go on to the last one. He also does this not only to change us, challenge us, but to condition us. And what I mean by this is there's a principle throughout the Word of God that the Lord stresses that we need, and that is learning to wait on Him. Learning to wait on God. The truth was, even though they were, they were afraid, they saw the army, the Lord let them in with nothing taking place, the Red Sea was not going to part until God let it part. It's just the truth. Nothing they could have did. It wasn't like, all right, we got two million people. Everybody get a bucket. Let's hit the Red Sea. There was nothing they could do. The Red Sea wasn't going to part until God said, part. They had to wait for God to work. And God waited till the time when he would get the most glory out of the situation. And it would change them the most. Sometimes that's the difficult part. Because of the point God has to wait to work to have the most benefit for you. God waited to the last possible moment. I mean, they were literally in marching. They're coming to attack. Many times our impatience... Our obsession today in Western culture with the clock can hinder us greatly. For we need to learn to wait on God. If you haven't learned it yet, God does not tell time like we do. There are times God uses those difficult times to teach us to wait on Him. Was it Psalm 27, 14? I think I can quote it. Uh, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31. There's so many verses that deal with stressing us with waiting on God. 
When you wait on God when you're in that bell savan, do you know what's taking place? You don't even realize it. it provided you're, you're trusting God, not allowing you to turn to bitterness. You know, I, I've uncovered lessons Moses learned in the desert about failure. But when you're learning, when, when you're learning to trust in God, in those moments, your life every day is more and more about God and you don't even realize it. Because you're having to wait on Him. Lord, there's no answer here. Lord. And you're actually strengthening and developing the most important relationship you have with the Creator. And when the time hit, notice what the Lord told Moses. I like that. He basically told Moses, stop praying. That's what he did. Don't cry after me anymore. Let's do this. See, a lot of people, they fail at that moment. When the Lord does direct and says, okay, now it's time to do this. You know, Rebecca, that's one of the reasons why God honored that. Because when he said it's time, you moved. When it's God directs, you move. You take that step. You'll never regret waiting on God. Never. But just like Moses found out, he very much regretted jumping ahead of God. When it wasn't time yet. You have to trust He's in control. You have to trust He knows what He's doing. He knows right where you're at. And you can use that belt to allow God to condition you to wait on Him. When I'll finish with this. I'll close with this. I don't even have my watch. I can't. Even, what time is it right now? I can't even read that. Ooh, okay. Wow. Okay, I'll finish this story and I'll close. I did not know it was that late. Uh, um, when, and you know part of this, I'm going to take it a little, bit, a little bit different angle, though. This is not the Dorito story that I tell. But notice, when we arrived, you know a lot of the difficulties we faced immediately. The challenges were, literally, I, I'm, there's, there's no exaggeration. They were enormous. Nothing like what we were ready for. Nothing like we had faced. I did two survey trips. I thought I was well prepared to bring my family into that. And then God changed everything literally the moment we arrived. He took the power out. We had no water. Again, from Cleveland, those are all big problems. <laughs> Uh, again, I'm not a camp. You should watch me just set up a tent. I will be there two weeks during the entire camping event just getting the tent set up. Just buy a camper. What in the world? You know, it's fun. The first things I did here were, were developing that campsite. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> and so the, cha the challenges hit. I mean, having to boil water, you know, not knowing what to do, having to find water, number one. Just having to find water. No power. Not expecting that. Day one. And the challenges just grew. It didn't end. I mean, from battling rats at night, I'm not, I, I, I can't hardly get anything accomplished or done. It is so incredibly hot. Sleeping in that initial structure was horrible. There was no airflow. It, was, it would drop. Even though it was about 82 outside, it would probably be 10 degrees cooler outside than inside. And then, uh, again, the malaria hit. That was horrible. And all the challenges we were facing. And, 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 and then, you know, you, I'm not going to the Dorito story where God changed my perspective on it. That's what I'm going through. I'm going to fast forward about two years. Life by this time was much easier for us. New Guinea became life. We're in a routine. Things are going. And I'm five hours from where we live. The other missionary's up there, Terry Thrun, and he asked me to come preach at the market. So I'm up there, I'm preaching at the market, and I'm getting ready to preach. And New Guinea open air preaching works. I enjoyed it there. They'll come and listen. And uh, I, it was just about, just about a weekly e event would be preaching at the markets there. Nothing like in the States. I'd have Bethany play her violin. They never heard anything like that. They would come. And then I would preach. And so we go. I go with Terry Thunder to the market. That's everybody does their shopping there. They're open markets. And so I'm getting ready to preach. And there's this big woman that lived down in Emma and I talked to her several times. And she starts pulling. The, our island was matriarchal. The women made all the decisions. And so she's grabbing people, which was not, it's not like the States. It was common. They're grabbing people. Come over here and listen. Come over here and listen. She's pulling people in. And she's saying this. This is my missionary. What is this? Has this been off for a while? Or just for all now? She says, this is my missionary. And I'm thinking, 
she's, and this is truth, she's never heard me preach. She's never come to one service I've held down there, ever. And she's pulling people in. This is my missionary. This is, come on, come on. And then the thought hit. I'll be right from the Lord. The thought hit. She did see when I was in the aid station with malaria, thought I was dying. She did see us with our family in the river, having to wash our clothes. She saw all that we went through. And you know what? I saw how the Lord used it. I saw why he said, when I'd say, please, why can't you just have this stop? I saw why I had to wait on the Lord. You trust him. Life is all about God. And by the way, we're here for a short time and it's over with. And all this is done. Just trust him with the days you have. It's all about him. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I'll give you just a minute to pray. However the Lord dealt with your heart, you just take a minute to pray on the things that you've heard taught this morning and preached. And then I'll close us in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I love you. Lord, I certainly thank you for our ladies in our church. Lord, I do pray for your blessing in your life as you give them wisdom and grace and strength. Lord, for the moms that are here, Lord, I pray that you help them with the rearing of their children. Uh, Lord, I pray for you'd be with the wives and their husbands, and, and Lord, bless those relationships. Lord, I pray for our ladies who are neither married yet. Uh, nor have children. Lord, I pray for special grace in their life and your blessing there and your help and your encouragement in their life. And Lord, help us as a church to be able to glorify and honor you. Lord, help us to deal with our bell, Safan, as you would have us, Lord, that we would allow it to change us, to challenge us, and to condition us so that we can better serve you. Lord, I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, boy, thank you all so much for coming. Just a great turnout today. And, uh, and we'll see you all tomorrow.